Hi, this is our pre-reading lecture for our articles by Ibsen and Schwartz. Um, we'll be talking about spectatorship and this idea of the spectacle. So in order to get into these readings, I wanted to give a little bit of historical and intellectual uh, background about the 19th century, what's going on politically, what are people thinking about, um, and then get into who is this modern spectator and what were their experiences like in 19th century Paris, since both of our examples are um, taking place there. Okay. So when we're thinking about the march through the 19th century for France, it's a pretty bumpy ride. Um, the era that we are looking at um, is after 19, or excuse me, after 1815 when Napoleon was defeated, and we see the restoration of the French monarchy. So there's a king and a queen, but there's tons of other stuff happening um, that is um, not old school like a monarch. Um, but instead, we begin to see the rise of the bourgeoisie, um, this newly dominant social class. So they're folks who are not part of the aristocracy. They're not kings and queens. They are, you know, upper middle class folks would be a way of thinking about it. They're professional. Um, they could hire people. They have employees, things of that nature. Um, so what's interesting about what happens to the bourgeoisie during this era is that in terms of lifestyle, they become very similar to the aristocracy. They're pretty fancy. They're bougie. That's where we get the word bougie. Okay, so um, what we see happening here is that the bourgeoisie are becoming more culturally influential, um, and part of this is due to the um, growth and development of capitalism. Um, and so folks that make money, not just folks with titles, are beginning to have more power. Okay, so they're defining themselves in contrast to the working class. Um, but what we also see happening is that the working class is developing ident an identity of its own, um, sometimes referred to as the proletariat, which is just another word for the working class. All right, so these new kinds of class identity necessarily relate to different kinds of political and cultural identities as well. Um, so as I mentioned before, right, the bourgeoisie, AKA the upper middle class, and then the proletariat is the working class. Okay. So in the middle of the uh, 19th century, there's a, another revolution. France loves this, right? So um, the French monarchy is overthrown after a really dramatic three-month siege in Paris that was led by um, a united force of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. So the upper middle class and the working class worked together to get rid of the monarchs. Um, they were pretty sick of that, um, and we can reflect back to our discussion of the Enlightenment as to why they might be sick of the continued power of monarchs or the aristocracy. Okay, so what happens after this revolution in 1848? We see the establishment of a republic, a representative form of government. Um, so we see this individual, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, he's elected president of the republic, and he is the nephew of the other Napoleon, the one that you always hear about. Um, and he is, okay, so he's elected, and then he's like, I don't want to stand for election again. I'd rather just be a dictator. I'd rather, you know have my power never checked. So he overthrows their version of the Congress, which is the assembly in 1851. And he de declares himself the dictator of the second French empire. So there goes the Republic. They're back into a um, form of dictatorship as opposed to representative rule. So now he's calling himself Napoleon the third. That's his new identity. Um, and essentially he is, um, engaged in creating a military dictatorship. So um, France then begins to engage in wars around the globe, engaging in the further development of their colonial empire. Um, and Napoleon III frames all of his activities as being sort of mandated by the people because remember they voted for me that one time? Well, they didn't vote for you that one time to become the dictator, but then he did. Okay, so. Um, there, in the middle of the 19th century, we begin to see different ways of understanding and theorizing the course of history. So we're probably familiar with the figure Karl Marx, but what we might not know is that it is the revolutions of 1848 that informed his um, desire to understand history more carefully, um, to understand how capitalism impacts the course of history. Um, so he's essentially um, trying to create a comprehensive account of everything, 
that's all, right, um, of human life. Um, and so for him, he puts the economy at the center of both culture and society. And so if we reflect on what we just discussed, this idea that um, our social class, our affiliations that we develop based on um, the money that we earn or the work that we do, um, fits into Karl Marx's view that the economy is the central driver of both culture and society. So he says that in order to know the truth about modern culture and society, you have to understand economic and labor conditions. And he calls this the materialist conception of history. Okay. Um, so for Marx, he sees society to be this kind of relationship between these two terms that he um, coins, the base and the superstructure. So the base is like all the stuff that's in the economy. So the factories, the machines, the land, the raw materials, and um, the ideas that structure it. So commodities, the stuff that we purchase and sell, private property, um, and wage labor. So the very idea of being paid by the hour is something that's relatively new. So we want to keep that in mind. So then the superstructure is basically everything else. So that includes the arts, which is interesting for us, um, but also includes media, um, culture, uh, religion, all the other stuff, essentially. So what Marx suggests is that the base determines the superstructure. So he's saying that essentially cultural life and value is determined by an economic system, that it's dependent on it, and that's um, what determines its shape. So from his perspective, the superstructure, the arts, politics, etc., is in the business of maintaining, legitimizing the base. So working to make these new economic relationships appear natural. So what we are probably identifying here is that he kind of sees art as having a function akin to propaganda to a certain extent, that it is um, a kind of rah-rah form of art that's a cheerleader for the current economic system. Okay, so here's Marx in his own words. Um, the bourgeoisie had stripped of its halo every occupation hitherto honored and looked up to with reverent awe. It has converted the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the man of science into its paid wage laborers. Constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty, and agitation distinguish the bourgeois epoch from all earlier ones. All that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profane, and man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life. Life and his relations with his kind. So one of the things that he sees about um, this capitalist era, which is what he's describing, is that we are now, our value is now solely determined by our earning power. There isn't this kind of um, halo, right? This kind of um, shine around particular um, forms of uh, cultural production, right? Uh, back in the day, right, the poet or the philosopher might have been quite um, vaunted members of society, and now he's suggesting, well, those don't make money, so who cares about them, right? So this idea um, that you have to sort of um, recognize your position as now being the product of how much money you can earn, essentially, and that this will produce constant kind of flux, constant conflict as well, because we're seeing um, a new value system, this value system that we still live with, so it probably feels pretty familiar familiar to us that is right monetized that's about how much money we earn um, and that that determines our value in society okay so for him as we suggest right art serves as either a distraction or as propaganda um, so he suggests that right art is simply working to justify and support the economic system um, and so as we read Ibsen's articles, we want to ask ourselves, does Manet agree? And Ibsen's article also addresses the world of the um, salon and the world of the academy. So we want to sort of keep this in mind. What is the function of art um, for Manet or for members of the French Academy? And we'll look at some visual examples of how Manet and other artists that are working at the same time think about the function of art. Okay. So, right, the salons are a big deal, as you guys will read about, um, and they were a large social gathering um, in which you'd see tons and tons and tons of images. Um, the salon style hang is really crazy. You can see how many paintings are in there. It's like super overwhelming. Um, and we'll talk about what is typically seen at the salon. That's going to be one of the things we'll look at. And then how do artists like Manet and Corbet and others um, kind of modify what is expected? 
All right, so this is the prime example of the academic painting, just so we have that in mind. And then we can start to think about how Manet and some of his contemporaries are diverging from this. So William Bougereau is a perfect example of this kind of quintessential form of academic painting that would have been super popular at the Salon. We'll talk more about this painting um, when we get together in our Zoom meeting. All right. So who is this modern spectator? That's what our two articles have in common. We're thinking about this person who is right, seeking out visual um, entertainment, seeking out visual experiences in this modernizing city. So artists like Manet are thinking about this new kind of viewer, this new urban subject. Um, and Paris is changing a ton um, during this um, second empire. A brand new city is essentially being created. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the kind of numbers in terms of how much of Paris was destroyed and what happened, etc. cetera. Um, but what we see happening is a fundamental change in everyday life based on this period of urban renewal in Paris. So we see the city of wide boulevards replacing this kind of maze-like medieval city that Paris had previously been. Um, and we also see this changing class dynamic. So rich and poor used to live side by side, sometimes in the same building. Um, but now we see this new Paris engaging in a form of kind of class segregation. So we'll talk a little bit more about that and how that impacts um, visual experience. So these, the other thing that happens around class identity, so at the same time that class segregation is happening, we also begin to see that uh, traditional forms of class identity um, begin to disappear with the growth of um, available fashion, right? This is kind of 19th century fast fashion. Um, people are dressing more and more alike despite their dissimilar social classes. So people in the working class and people in the bourgeoisie um, may be wearing the same clothes. So you can't look at someone and say, oh, that's a working class person or that's a middle class person. I can't tell, right? You can't tell anymore. So um, the modern spectator has to become a skeptical viewer. They have to be discerning. They have to do more kind of detective work to make sense of this completely transforming and changing world around them. All right. So um, what we're kind of thinking about here is that um, the new spatial order of Paris is also a new social order, as we made a note of um, a moment ago as well. So this uh, modern spectator is often referred to as the flaneur. Um, and the flaneur is like a window shopper, someone who's trying to observe and make sense of this new world of experiences, this new growing um, world of commodities, this new growing world of greater availability of media. So the flaneur is essentially an investigator of the city. Um, and if you have to investigate, that means it's hard to understand, right? And it's kind of suggesting that this new city is unfamiliar, um, potentially alienating. And so you got to do the work of figuring out what's going on. Okay. So yeah, urban renewal in Paris, right? So Paris grows at a kind of exponential rate throughout the 19th century. And these tiny little medieval streets are getting a little crowded. Um, we got some sanitary concerns in terms of, you know, plumbing and, you know, stuff like that. Um, and we also see the sense that, right, if Napoleon III, this new military dictator, is in charge of France, he wants uh, Paris to become the shining beacon, this capital of the 19th century. He wants Paris to grow as the center of commerce. And so um, this remaking and renewal in Paris is about making the city conform to this idea that Paris is the capital of the 19th century. It's where the future happens first, um, that this is going to be um, the kind of guiding light for what 19th century culture is going to be all about. So he hires this guy, um, George Eugene Hausman, to make a plan for new modern Paris in 1853. Okay. So when you're changing um, space in a city, you're not just changing physical space, you're changing history, you're changing the meaning of a space, you're changing its kind of social and political um, significance. So as we talked about earlier, that siege that led to the establishment of the Republic was, um, right, everyday individuals in Paris taking control over the Parisian streets. And they're able to do so in these small kind of medieval streets. So we see Napoleon III is interested in kind of erasing that history of rebellion because as we know, he's a dictator and wants to hold on to power. So this spatial transformation is also about kind of erasing that history of political opposition as well. And right, these wide boulevards offer more visibility. They offer um, the ability to move both um, goods out of the city, but also to move troops if you had to as well. Okay, so yeah, um, modern Paris is probably what we think of as, right, old school Paris, but we want to understand that most of Paris was 
um, torn down and rebuilt during this period of house minimization. So these iconic images of what Paris looks like are the product of this era of um, creative destruction, right? So destroying something in order to create something new. All right. So um, we want to keep all of this in mind as we jump into our reading by Schwartz. Um, so thinking about why would the modern spectator seek out the kinds of entertainment that she describes. So thinking about that, I will see all of you.